vaccine is uh, 72, I think, or 75 percent effective. Uh, they think that it will be approved by the end of next week. Um, and they say that they can have 100 million doses ready by the end of February. So we are also on a huge downtrend. We were talking about it in my environmental class. Um, if you start looking at the um, new cases per day, uh, then those have broke over and um, we're reducing by about 34%, 35% per day um, over the last week. And um, there's speculation as to why that's happening, um, but they, it, it's number one, we're starting to vaccinate, but two, enough people have had it, right? And then February uh, or January, February are traditionally months that you don't gather, right? You guys with me? And so they think that those combined are, and, and maybe we're reaching herd immunity, okay, here in the United States. They don't know for sure. It'll take time, the numbers will bear out. Um, I'm big on numbers. You guys big on numbers? Yeah, I, I, I really am. I look at those things, and I also look at scientific publications, and I'm not picking, I had a conversation with a student in lab yesterday, and I've actually had two others, and I wanna talk about something, the vaccine. I was asked, would I take the vaccine, and I said yes. Okay, and, and then there was a discussion about the risks of um, sterility, um, inhibition of reproductive systems and those types of things. And so I, I had actually already done the search before, but I wanted you guys to see how you can go look at the scientific literature. You guys understand that? Not the papers, not the internet, not those types of things, but actually where you can look at abstracts, get many articles that are on that topic, okay? And because to me, that's where the real information is at. It's coming from the numbers, right? And so I, I want to, for, for us in chemistry, we use something called SciFinder. SciFinder is a search in, an engine that search, searches CAS, which is the chemical abstracting service, right? And, and it's got just about, they've even gone back in time and put in um, abstracts from articles from, uh, paper days, right? And, and so all of chemistry can be searched in one convenient search engine. Does anybody know what it is for medicine? PubMed, have you guys ever heard of PubMed? Mm -hmm. So PubMed is a search engine which is commonly used in that world. Um, and I actually used it when I was doing pharmaceutical chemistry for the one year of my postdoctoral fellowship because the things that we were referring to in that were, were in that search engine. And so I go to one search engine, Google, then to find another search engine, right? Because I, um, and so once we arrive there, it, it, it's very straightforward, right? And so if we just type in COVID-19, uh, right, to do a search and we hit enter, and we can see the number of publications that have been produced on the disease COVID-19, right? 97,000 uh, articles have already been published. That's a little bit heavy to sort through, right? And, and so I, I'm gonna add uh, another keyword to the search to narrow that down, right? And so I'm gonna put in pregnancy, right? And, oops, I didn't spell pregnancy right in there. And so now we're at 1,800 articles. You, you guys with me? And so there's quite a bit about that because of uh, what the risks would be, not only from the mother to the fetus, but from the um, uh, patient in a delivery having the disease to how to manage that, especially when they have the severe respiratory one when I was looking through articles and those, those types of things were talked about general maintenance, and, and also if you um, do miscarriage, because Carol Bro, our key chemist, and I were talking about this, and I was asking her whether I should do what I'm doing right now. So I, I asked uh, uh, someone else 
in my department, a female and I said, hey, can I talk about this and is this appropriate? And then we, we had an extended conversation about it and, and some of the perceptions that he, she had. And, and so we talked about miscarriage with this. And so anyway, if we um, add that, then there's articles, it's gonna narrow the results, right? Because I've made it narrower in, in, in scope. And so if we start looking at these articles, then what we find is that there's a little mixed information, um, but I mean, you literally can click on them and get the abstract, right? To evaluate the effect of COVID disease 2019 on um, maternal prenatal or perinatal neonatal outcome of performing a systematic review of available published literature. So this is a review article that talks about a whole bunch of articles and what's in that. You, you guys with me? And so you can find general information and then to what the outcomes are, you can go look. But but they're actually showing that the miscarriage rate is remaining constant with uh, pregnancies even through the COVID is the, the general gist that I got. That may be not completely correct because I didn't read a lot of articles. Does that make sense? When I really wanna know something about it, then I read a whole bunch of articles, right? And and start putting those together. I look at the reviews and see what they say. And then when I go one step farther and, and I want to talk about um, the vaccine, right? And so if we type in vaccine um, and we do that search, then what we find is that there's uh, 3,593 articles published on the vaccines, right? But when I add a second search word to that and narrow that topic, and um, what would be the word that I would want to use? Right, sterility? Okay, well, if we do it in that order, it may actually do some, give us something else, but we'll, um, And so um, we've got 19 articles and um, when you start going through these, what you find is that there is no impact on the reproductive systems from this vaccine or any other, okay? And so then if you, for example, do an internet search and when you look at like Mayo Hospital or John Hopkins Hospital, they address it that there is no risk, shown risk from that. But now in the conversation that I had with my student, if there is some concern, you guys are young, and if you waited to take the vaccine, then that would be a reasonable thing to do. Does that make sense? Um, but then I would argue that you would want to be cautious about spreading the disease to others. Right, does, does that make sense? And so we're at a place in time where this is unprecedented. And, and so, yeah. Do you think they'd let us wait to take the vaccine? Or do you think when it comes to- I, They will not require it initially, I know that. I, I don't believe that they will, okay? I think that after the vaccine has proved safe, the efficacy of that for a year or two, then yes, it's gonna be required to come on the campuses with, with that vaccine in place, yeah, yeah. On to that, like, if you've been told by a medical personnel not to take it because you have aller like, I'm definitely allergic to anything that has penicillin yep, in it, I and I'm asthmatic. That's a different, that's a whole different risk, and there is evidence of that, and they're working on that. They're working on changing that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or, for example, the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine works on a different mechanism, and so it may be safe for someone like you, but we don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, anyway, I... I I just felt like this is something that we have so much misinformation on the internet right now, right? And that, the, and I'm also gonna say it this way, if a vaccine is produced and it caused sterility, right, you guys with me? And you sat on the jury, jury that is in the class action lawsuit against Pfizer, and there was strong evidence that it caused sterility, you already know how you would vote. You guys know that, right? How many people would vote to take Pfizer's profits and give them to the lawyers? I mean, the people. That was a joke. 
My sister's a lawyer. Yes. Oh, yeah, you would vote to give the money to people, wouldn't you? Yeah, all of us would, right? So what I'm trying to say is that the scientific evidence isn't showing that there's sterility caused by the vaccine, okay? That's not an efficacy that's been shown in vaccines. This is a new type of vaccine, I know that. But the stuff that looks so real on the internet isn't real, okay? It's some cruel person in my mind that is being opportunistic because they don't believe in vaccines, right? Smallpox is gone almost completely because of vaccines. Polio is gone. I had a high school teacher that had a, a pad that she walked on and her shoes were custom built and one shoe had a platform that was about four inches tall because she had a leg that was shorter than the other one from polio that she had in childhood, right? She was a wonderful lady. <laughs> She's my most memorable teacher, okay? I, I was not much of a good quality student in high school, okay? Not that I wasn't intelligent enough, I just forgot to go to class a lot. My senior year, I probably missed 30 days. And, uh, the system that was in place allowed that. Does that make sense? And Mrs. Massey uh, was my college prep teacher and I had written all the papers, I had turned in uh, all the assignments, and I had taken all of her tests, and she gave me an F at quarter. And I went to Mrs. Massey, I was a little bit upset, because my quarter grades and my mother wanted to know why I had an F. And I went and talked to her. And she was about 4'10", height-wise, even with the uh, platform on the one leg, right? And she looked up at me and she took her finger and put it right in my nose. And she said, Mitch Garrison, she said, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how academically prone you think you are. But if you don't come to my class, I can't teach you anything. And so I'm gonna give you an F if you don't show up for every day for the rest of the semester. You know what I did? I went to class every day for the rest of the semester. The other teachers who allowed me to get away with it, they were in the wrong. I didn't think so at the time. You guys with me? No. But she was the correct teacher. So there's lessons to be learned in life. Sometimes we think we know the right answer and we have formed our opinion on that. And But when we really look at it, it's something a little bit different than what it is. Okay? And I think that story relates to what I'm talking about with what the information that we're getting and how we're getting it nowadays and how that information is sometimes flawed, okay? And so when we read it on the internet, it should be considered fun, right? In the social media platforms. Now, can you get an idea and then go research that through uh, more scientific route? or you can get true numbers and those types of things? And the answer is yes, you can, okay? Does that make sense? So I'm just throwing that out there. Um, one thing about it, we're blessed. This is humor right now, this is sarcasm. You guys are gonna catch this, right? We've done such a great job in the state of Missouri getting the vaccine out that, oh wait a minute, we're number 49th now, we've moved up. We're not the worst state in the nation anymore, all right? We have been passed by, I believe, Idaho, all right, for that last fall. So, but hey, that means that as those vaccines are distributed, then um, they should be available for you if you wanna take them, okay? So anyway, um, I plan to, but like I said in my conversation um, yesterday that uh, we, we make choices in life and my choice would be to take it, but I am well past my reproductive ages, age and there's no concern with that. I'm more concerned with the disease and what it could do to someone like me, okay? So I'm at that place and, and would like to to move forward. So I would encourage you guys to look at it from that perspective. And if you're really interested, this is what nerds do. All right, we go look at that and we use those to guide us in our decision making. Okay? Yeah. So anyway.
fine. Um, sapling, let's talk about sapling for a second and housekeeping, all right? Um, I don't know what's going on with it, okay? I had Jackie uh, stand uh, twice into the help desk yesterday. Um, chapter nine won't open and the molecular structure won't open. Everything else opens as far as I know, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not sure why that's happening. Uh, I just made chapter nine extra credit anyway, so people could go back and review that uh, since we started in a different place than, uh, for example, we ended last year, right? And so that you would have that opportunity to review. Um, like I said, I don't know why it's doing that. We're working on it. If we can't get help through sapling themselves, then we'll talk to the computer center and see if it's something. But this is happening on your personal computers too, isn't it? Yeah, so I promise you guys, I'm up here, let's see. I can log on, can't I? So I don't give away my password. How embarrassing would that be? Just so I don't do any tricks or anything else, I just got logged on, I'm there. Let's see what happens. So, how to create those assessments. Oh, this video is will provide a brief introduction hmm. to the assessment. Well, it opened. Uh, maybe that one's not set up. That's what the problem with it is. Here's chapter nine. So, um, blue structure of methane, the carbonate ion, carbon dioxide, and the sulfide ion are given. Um, predict the molecular shape. So methane is tetrahedral. Oh my gosh, I've got all the answers. <laughs> but it does work, so anyway, that's actually what I did yesterday. That's why it's answered on that. So, um, but anyway, so you guys can see that it's working for me. So yeah, I, I just want you to know that. Does that make sense? So I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's a setting on the browser or something along that line. If somebody does figure it out, can you pass that along to the rest of the class? Yeah, so um, I'll move those dates uh, on that. They're not set in stone, you guys know that, right? So we'll get it figured out and get that fixed. Any comments or questions on that? Just go on and do the next chapter, right? You guys know there's always sapling problems available and there's always multiple chapters up. And if you have struggles with one chapter or something like that, you can go on and start working on the next one. You don't have to do them, do them in linear fashion, right? You guys know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can work out of words. It doesn't, doesn't cause any problem at all. Okay? All right. Any other housekeeping items? It's Friday. We're almost done with week two. All right? That means we only have 13 weeks remaining. <laughs> okay, so and I've now spent 20 minutes of today. It's lost and gone, but I actually think it was over a good topic. I hope you guys did. Okay, so because I'm trying to teach science, right? And you guys should know that Google is wonderful. I use it every single day, right? I even used it to find the search engine that I wanted to use that was more appropriate. Okay, but Google doesn't have all the answers, neither does Wikipedia. Okay. Now, Wikipedia is a hundred times better than it was five years ago. 
It really is because the editing on it is getting much, much better and real people are editing. And so people who go read the scientific literature are helping with those concepts. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's definitely improving, but not all. Chad, pretty flexible time. Just gonna throw it up. Okay, does that make sense? Now, it's not to say it doesn't give you the right answer, but it doesn't give you the right concept. All right, just, just say. All right, composition of error. When you think of error, what elements do you think of? Oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, argon, right? It's actually quite a bit of argon in the atmosphere. There's enough that we do some analysis through headspace. You guys know what headspace is? Where you have a, a container that is sealed, has a septum on top of it, you take a syringe, it's got a liquid or even a solid in it, and you can take a syringe and pull a sample out of the air above the sample, right? And because the molecules that are volatile inside of the sample are in exchange with the atmosphere above it. You guys with me? And so I can pull out a volume of gas, put that into a mass spectrometer, right? A GCMS, and I can separate those molecules that are in that gas. And guess what shows up every time in that experiment if the time window is correct? Argon, okay? And you think you initially have found something until you click on it and you get its characteristic molecular weight and you say, oh, that's argon. Okay, and then you can have this great conversation about the atmosphere. Yeah, because these gases are present, nitrogen, oxygen. Well, those two, gosh, most of the time, I, when I'm talking about the atmosphere, I say 80% N2 and 20% O2, and I ignore everything else. <laughs> and that, I mean, kind of funny. And this is even, 78 and 21 here, right? But roughly, it's somewhere close to that. Is there a margin of error in those measurements? Yeah, so plus or minus some value, so I'm sure I'm within that plus or minus value. And will the concentration shift depending on where we're at in the world? A little bit, okay? So yeah, it's mixing all the time and, and things are using or making and and so those things all exist in there, all right? Now, the next one, CO2. Let's talk about that for a minute. Is there something cool going on with CO2? Yes. Something hot going on with CO2. Would we better be out? It's a really hot topic right now, all right? Bad joke. All right, so CO2 right now is on the rise. One, I need to pull these numbers. I, I have seen them twice now. I need to pull the numbers and put them into, I'll try to get it in at the end of this chapter. We're gonna talk about pollution and I wanna talk about what the CO2 levels have done during the pandemic. Does anybody know? It's the first drop and that drop is so significant then, now I know we've withdrawn from the um, uh, uh, the Paris Accords. Um, there's another name for it too. There's another one too that we withdrew from in terms of getting our CO2 down um, by, and I can't remember the year now. I got to go look at all that. All right, but what I do know is that they think we may be able to meet that 19. It's a 19 percent reduction because of the pandemic. because so much less fossil fuel has been used since this has started that those numbers are coming down and we may be able to meet what we had originally said in the agreement that we would do. Isn't that crazy? So man can reduce that if we choose to. Now you have to decide it's a problem first, right? And we'll look at some numbers that will show that too, okay? We'll talk about that. We talked about it a little bit last semester, didn't we? So anyway, 
I just want you guys to think about that in, 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 a, in a way. Did you see the news from GM yesterday? They said by 2035, they will not produce a combustion engine on any of their manufacturing lines. They're going zero emission. First automaker other than the ones who are already zero emission, right? First one of the majors to make that commitment. So guess what? When you're my age, you may only have a combustion engine if you have a collector item and heat. That's crazy, okay? All right? But I can tell you, I've worked on some flatheads, combustion engines, right? What we have today are a lot better, okay? So we can change with time, and that's a good thing, all right? Listening to science can be great. All right. The atmosphere. Okay. So, atmosphere is pretty, uh, is it big? Yeah, the Earth is, well, I guess it's big. I mean, when you compare it to what we are in size, or, but if you compare it to, you know, a solar system, it's not very big, right? But depending on how you compare it, the planet's pretty big. And then around that planet is, uh, is an atmosphere sometimes, right? And of some sort. And so the important part of the atmosphere for us is this right here. Okay, well, I say that we have some issues with here too that we can talk about. But that bottom part of that, the troposphere, is where we live. Okay, and where we don't want that pollution to be there, where we don't want the uh, uh, dangerous gases or too much heating or too much cooling. We want another ice age. No, that'd be pretty measurable, okay? I like snow, but I don't know if I like it all the time. Does that make sense? You guys with me? So, and there have been ice ages in recent times, right? Geologically. And so all of Europe was covered for a period of time. They believe that an ice dam broke um, and released a whole bunch of fresh water into the uh, North Atlantic current and cut it off, and when that happened, the North Atlantic didn't, current didn't bring warmer ocean water to Europe to keep the temperature up, so in the uh, 1400s, it froze, okay? So the atmosphere was affected by the ocean currents. It's real, it happens, okay? Well, because water maintains the heat that we retain here on the earth. It's the number one greenhouse gas, right? And also liquid water plays a role in that. We're blessed to have all those oceans. That way mammals can survive here, right? In the way that we do. All right, if we go up, we've got the stratosphere, right? Then the mesosphere and the thermosphere. Between each of those is a pause, right? Those are the boundaries, they're, they're stratification. And so the chemical composition of the troposphere is much different than the stratosphere, which is different than the mesosphere, which is different from the thermosphere. Okay? So the composition changes as we go up. Okay? And the other thing that changes, and this chapter covers a lot of that, is what do we see in this curve? This is pressure and torque. We're starting out at ground level, sea level. We should start there. And we have one atmosphere of pressure. Would you guys agree with that? That's the average value there. And so, but this is in Tor, which is equal to millimeters of mercury, which, what's the conversion from atmosphere to Tor or millimeters of mercury? 760. 760, we did that last time, right? And so this starts at 760 Tor, and look, it goes down to about 170, okay? And so, well, there's a lot of things that go on with that. Can we breathe when we're in the stratosphere? No, what do we, even at the top of the tropopause, what's happening there? When we get right here. You got pressure. What happens when you climb Mount Everest? You need oxygen. You need oxygen. Do a lot of people die on top of Mount Everest because of a lack of oxygen? And the answer is yes, a whole bunch. 
okay? Over the years, many, many people have died because the low pressure there, the, the percentage of oxygen is the same, right? You guys with me? But the, in the atmosphere, but the pressure doesn't allow the exchange across the uh, membrane in your lungs. And so because of that, you, well, you get mentally challenged to function normally. And there's also some other maladies that occur, okay? But ultimately, it is a super high risk activity to go there. You guys know that, right? Wouldn't it be cool to do? Yeah. Is it part of like the reason you can't breathe on that river is also because of temperature? The temperature plays a role in that, but it's more the partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, and so when you, even when you go to full oxygen, when you're taking supplement up there, right, then the pressure's not high enough to save some of those people to get enough oxygen to move across that membrane, even at 100% oxygen. Okay, you know, which is just kind of crazy to me. So, I thought maybe for a, a good income, if you could talk uh, the government over there into this, that you could put an oxygen manufacturing facility up at base camp, right? And refill the bottles. So they say the piles of empty oxygen containers is just huge up there. Yeah. Interesting concept, isn't it? Yeah. Because are people going to continue to climb Everest? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt. Why? Because it's there. So, what's gas pressure caused by? What's gas pressure caused by? Collisions, right? Is that what everybody's thinking? Yeah, gas pressure is caused by collisions. The energy, well, what type of energy is it? Is a gas molecule moving or is it potential? It's moving. There's kinetic energy, well, except at what temperature? Absolute zero. That's for a kinetic molecular theory, which we'll go over again here in a second. All right? Um, all of it. But anyway, so gas is, it, pressure is caused by the bombardment of atoms on the wall. If I add more atoms to a contained system, then I get more collisions, right? The bicycle tire we were talking about. Okay? If I heat it, then what happens? It goes faster, right? There's more energy present, so that's higher velocity. Higher velocity means more energy is transferred in each collision. You guys with me? So we say the gas expands as we heat it. Yeah, you guys with me? Okay. So if it's contained, then the pressure goes up. All right. So in fact, we have seen this in the first semester. So this is a review. It's actually it's close to the first lecture. But a gas is composed of molecules whose size is much smaller than the distances between them. What's in the space between them? From a chemist's perspective. Empty Nothing. Empty space. Okay? I've got an atom here, I've got an atom there, and the space between them is empty space. Cool? You guys with me? All right. They move randomly. They generally travel in straight lines, okay, from point to point, unless they run into something and are deflected or reversed in direction. Now, we know that they're reversed in direction because the collisions are elastic, okay? They move in random directions and their collisions are elastic, so that means that the energy is either transferred to what it runs into or well, it bounces too, okay? And attractive forces between particles have a negligible effect on their behavior. Now this is for an ideal gas, right? Are there materials which have attractive forces between them? And what do we call those attractive forces? Van der Waals forces, right? And we can have London forces. We can have dipole-dipole, induced dipole, we could have even up to hydrogen bonding. You guys with me? And so, well, that means that things that are gases in the real world 
when the temperature drops low enough and they're sticky enough, they actually change phase, don't they? The gases become liquids or the gases become solids and depending on the conditions that are present. Okay, so anyway, but not for ideal gases. And so in this relationship, the kinetic energy of a gas molecule is proportional to the absolute temperature. And what we find is that real gases in the atmosphere right now, right here, are behaving fairly close to ideal. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah, so they behave in this fashion. So it allows us to talk about gases and to make statements about gases from some basic mathematics, right? Number one, we can get the kinetic energy of a, of a molecule, and it's one half. What's the M? The mass, right? Mass is really important, isn't it? Right, because that's how big you are. And then what's the B following? The velocity, right? And so the energy of that can be found if we know the mass and the velocity, okay? Now this is gonna show, I'm gonna, hopefully you'll think this is cool. I think it's cool, all right? Well, because I'm a nerd, but if I have oxygen, right, and I have it at 25 uh, degrees C, then my average speed for the oxygen is, oh, somewhere right about here. If I change the temperature to 1,000 degrees, then my average speed increases to here, right? And so this is in molecular speed, uh, meters per second. And so we can see that there's a huge change with that change in temperature. Okay, I always say I, I don't know this. This is a, this is one of those internet things that I have no verifiable evidence. Okay, but the the reason we're so tired on a hot day is we get beat up more. <laughs> right. There's more collisions of the atmosphere on us. Now there's other things that are going on. For example, we have a cooling system that's having to work a lot harder. And so we are processing a lot more water and sweat and those types of things, right? And so there's physiological differences on a hot day versus a cool day, right? You guys with me, right? Because I know I'm pretty tired after I spent the whole day on the lake with, uh, you know, like four layers of clothes on and it's um, 31 degrees and the wind's blowing, okay? And you're pretty exhausted that day too, about like on a hot day. Now, the ones that are greater than 60 degrees, yeah, those are the beautiful days. Sunshine, no wind, distribution. Now, this next slide is really cool. This is the one I was really thinking of. I, got, I, I was one ahead of you guys, okay? So I was really thinking about this one. And this is showing oxygen, nitrogen, uh, water and helium and it's showing their molecular speed right and the number of molecules so like the previous slide is showing the average molecular speed now these all have the equivalent kinetic energy right why is oxygen going slower than nitrogen on average going slower than water on average going slower than helium on average why they have more mass per molecule, right? Now, there's a really cool thing. You don't have to know the mass of the individual molecule. Can you just use your periodic table to find the answer to this? Now, you could take the molecular weight and divide it by Avogadro's number and get the individual mass of one atom, but it's not really necessary. But if I look at, at O2, O2 has a molecular weight of 32 grams per mole, right? N2 equals 28 grams per mole. H2O equals 18 grams per mole. And helium is four grams per mole. You guys wanna know why I can do chemistry faster than you? It's because I already know all those molecular weights, right? You, you guys with me? Yeah, that just comes with time, doesn't it? Yeah, it just comes with time. So, if someone gives you a question, 
right? A concept question at 25 degrees, and they say put these atoms and molecules in average speed. Can you do it now? When they have equivalent kinetic energy? Or they might ask the question at the same temperature, right? Because at the same temperature, those molecules, that energy is distributed throughout the system, and so their speeds should be proportional to their mass. So how are you guys doing? You got it yet? What's the biggest one? CL2. CL2, right? So 35 times 2, right? So 70. What's the next one? N2. N2 is 28. And then? Any neon, right? And then? Methane, right? And so that methane, now isn't that funny? It's got four atoms present. So you'd think it would go slower, right? Just by looking, right? And then neon would go the fastest because there's only one of them. That's not true, is it? It's the mass that makes a difference, okay? It's the mass that makes a difference, which is really neat that we can look at it and see that. Now, what's interesting is small molecules like hydrogen and helium, they can actually gain enough energy to escape into space sometimes. Yeah. That's what they say anyway. I've never read a scientific article, I just read a line in the textbook that said that. Kind of cool though. Think about that one. But does that mean if it can escape into space, it can come from space to here? Are there atoms in deep space? Yeah, just not very many of them, right? A lot less than what there is where there's a huge gravitational pull, right? From a planet or star or so on. But yes, there's actually regions of space that have molecules, which is so cool out there in that vacuum. All right, there's our answer. Use atomic mass units. We did that. All right, Boyle's Law. Now, if you took chemistry last semester here, and one of our last labs in the semester looked at Boyle's and Charles Law. We used them uh, in two experiments for Boyle's Law. We took a syringe, we hooked it to a pressure sensor, and we started it on 20 uh, milliliters of volume, and we decreased that down to about seven milliliters of volume, and we recorded the pressure change with each decrease in volume, right? We tried to hold the temperature constant. We tried to hold the um, number of gas molecules present, constant, right? And then look at the relationship of volume and pressure. And so what we find through Boyle's Law is that volume is proportional to one over the pressure, okay? Volume is proportional to one over the pressure. So if we rewrite that expression, and we put in what's called a proportionality constant. See the A up there in the second equation? All right, that's our proportionality constant for Boyle's Law. It's just a, a variable. We know that value, value in this relationship. And so thus we can make that B times P equal to a constant. And so that means that if I change one, the other has to change proportionally. You guys catch that? And so, well, this is for an ideal gas, but what did I say about real gases in this room? They're fairly ideal at the conditions that we have here, okay? So anyway, we'll look at deviation from that in a minute. So then what happens is that I can set this up in an expression that's useful, right? Where just like our C1V1 equation equals C2V2, this is the same type where we're looking at changes V1, P1 equals V2, P2, okay? And when I change one, the other has to change proportionally. And so, well, I can look at the, 
that they're state functions, right? They're described, doesn't matter how we get there. If we know one of the states, then we can find the other one from that. Cool? All right. The Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law is what relationship? Pressure? Volume, right? Or volume inverse pressure, if you want to say it that way. And I want to show you this because a lot of us made the left graph when we were doing lab first, right? So we plotted volume versus pressure. You guys remember doing that? And what do we find? A curved line. Not as useful as the other one, which shows the proportionality volume versus one over pressure. And what's the slope of that line? What's it equal? The proportionality constant. Yeah. So that is the proper plot for Boyle's Law. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about that. We actually use that to find the constant for a more complex relationship, a relationship which we added in Charles' law, right? And Avogadro's law, which we didn't talk about that as much then, but we'll, uh, we will. This is actually showing uh, a uh, J2 as a pressure device, okay? And so you can measure the volume of something by pressure. And so you fill the tube um, to the mark here. When the atmosphere pushes down, it pushes it up. Um, when I take pressure away or add more mercury, this in this case, I added more mercury, then what happens is I put more weight on it and I diminish the volume, okay? And so, but those volumes change as we change the pressure, right? And that's showing an example of Boyle's Law. I like our syringe thing that we did. We all know what that is. And I talked about a worm experiment, right? And the worm experiment used a device like this where we could check the pressure change by removing the CO2 in a container, right? And so as the CO2 is removed, the gas volume and the chamber went down because the oxygen was being used up, right? By the, the worms respiring. And so the pressure changed. And so it pulled the liquid and you could measure the liquid movement to get the pressure change. I just thought it was so cool, okay? So, but that's what this is showing. Less pressure, we have a shift that direction and increased pressure. In engineering, in, uh, Dr. Aker's office, I was going to take it and he ended up keeping it. They had some that glassware that was donated and they have a device where it has uh, liquid in it and when you hold your hand on one side it moves, right? And then when you take the temperature, the heat increase away and it comes back. It's the coolest thing in the world, all right? So just throwing it out there, you should ask him about it. Am I out of time? These people start to move. Oh, it is 9.50. Have a great weekend, guys. Stay safe this weekend.